Hello, dear students. Today we are going to discuss with you about pathophysiology of kidney. And our agenda today includes next points. Uh, firstly, uh, we have to talk about anatomy, physiology and normal kidney function very briefly. Then we move to the pathophysiology of uh, disorders of filtration, reabsorption and secretion. Then we have to talk about the main syndromes which is associated with kidney pathology and move to the disorders. And uh, we will talk about uh, glomerular nephritis, uh, tubulopathies, uh, disorders of interstitium, and uh, we also have to talk today about the acute and chronic renal failure, uh, about the main mechanisms of um, symptoms development and about the mechanisms of pathogenesis and principles of the pathogenetical treatment of all this type of disorders. So let's start and firstly we have to talk about the anatomy of a kidney and hope that you remember that it is structurally complex organ that has involved to carry out a number of important functions such as regulation of water and salt, maintenance of uh, acid-base balance, uh, excretion of different waste products of metabolism, uh, secretion of a variety of hormones and autocoids. And also hope that you remember that functional unit of kidney is nephron and uh, in glomerulus the blood is filtered uh, then ultrafiltrate is transported across the tubule wall and re-enters the blood. And this process is we know as an resorption and reabsorption. And when we are going to discuss about uh, kidney pathophysiology, uh, we have to remember that, that um, mostly pathophysiology associated with disorders of uh, kidney function. Uh, so it could be problems with uh, filtration could be problems with reabsorption or secretion. Um, you know from the course of normal anatomy that the renal corpuscle is situated in the renal cortex and uh, is made up of Bowen's capsule and glomerulus. And also we have a um, group of tubules which helps to eliminate urine. Uh, such as proximal tubule, loop of Henle and distal tube. Uh, you also uh, remember that uh, interior of Bowman's capsule, uh, called Bowman's space, collect the filtrate from the filtering capillaries of the glomerular tuft, which is also contains mesangial cell supporting these capillaries. And uh, this uh, components function as filtration unit and make up the renal corpuscle. The filtering structure, glomerular filtration barrier, has three layers composed of endothelial cells, basement membrane, and podocytes. The tubule have five uh, anatomically functionally different parts, and we mentioned already about the proximal and distal tubule, and also loop of Henle, but you remember that um, it has two parts, such as ascending loop of Henle and uh, distal descending part. And finally, all, all this group of tubules associates with connecting tubule and con co collecting duct. Nephrons have um, two lengths with different urine concentrated capacities long juxtaglomerular nephrons and short cortical nephrons. And uh, generally there are four mechanisms which we use finally for uh, performing uh, appropriate kidney function, such as filtration, reabsorption, secretion and also excretion. And first of all, filtration occurs in uh, the glomerulus and it is uh, largely post passive process which depend on the intracapillary blood pressure and we will discuss today about that. Uh, normally on only components of blood that are not filtered into bone man's capsule are proteins, RBC and WBC and platelets. Uh, 
and uh, over 150 liters of fluid and deglomeruli often in adult every day. And you understand that most of amount of this fluid, so around 99% of water uh, is that fil uh, filtrate uh, is reabsorbed finally. Process of reabsorption occurs in the renal tubules and is either passive due to diffusion or it also could be active uh, due to pumping against the concentration gradient. And we have in different substances which are reabsorbed. Mm, uh, we have to name them. Uh, it is water, um, glucose, amino acids, um, sodium chloride, also lactate, magnesium, calcium, uric acid and bicarbonate. And next process is secretion, which is also occurs in tubules and it is active. Uh, the substances uh, secreted include um, creatinine, potassium, hydrogen ion, urea and uric acid. And um, also we have to name uh, about the uh, uh, exocrine function of the kidney. Uh, so some, uh, ho um, some hormones which signal the tubule to alter the reabsorption or secretion, they will maintain homeostasis. And uh, uh, these hormones, uh, I hope yet that you're familiar with them, it is an ADH, aldosterone, and it also a parathyroid hormone, partially uh, glucocorticosteroids, uh, and also a specific kind of peptide, uh, such as um, uh, natriuretic peptide, which produced in right atrium, and brain, brain natriuretic peptide, which is participate in regulation of the sodium. And uh, con concurrent system in the renal medulla provides the mechanism for generation of uh, uh, hypertonic interstitium, uh, which allows the recovery of uh, solid-free water from within the nephron and returning it into the venous vasculature when appropriate. Uh, so all of these processes associate with uh, main function performing of, uh, um, by kidney. And uh, if we will name this function of kidney, the main one, uh, is maintaining of homeostasis and um, maintaining constancy of extracellular fluid volume and plasma osmolarity by balancing intake and excretion of sodium and water. It also maintaining of acid-base balance and we already discussed about it in topic of acid-base balance disorders and you know that uh, renal mechanisms of um, uh, compensation, of regulation, uh, is one of the most uh, effective, a bit long term, but the most effective. Uh, the next uh, function of kidney uh, is excretory function and releasing of different metabolic products and xenobiotics. Regulatory function, which is participate in regulation of BP, erythropoiesis, coagulation, and metabolic function and source of hormones and uh, we mentioned already hormones which participate in regulation of kidney function, but also kidney uh, can be as an, uh, pros, uh, as an um, organ which participate in releasing of hormone. Uh, it's uh, familiar for you, renin and duodenal aldosterone system. Also, um, uh, kidney can be as a source of erythropoietin, uh, different kind of prostaglandins, and also it participates in regulation of uh, D-hormone. Uh, so let's talk about pathology and according to the, this division of the homeostatic function, we have to uh, redistribute pathology into the same types. And we have to start from the pathology of filtration. Uh, you know that lots of uh, liters of fluid filtered by kidney per day and the level of uh, filtration associated with the definition and with the level of glomerular filtration rate, uh, which is usually depends on next um, uh, factors. Uh, 
it associates with amount of functioning glomeruli, so quantity of functional nephrons. Then uh, characteristic of renal blood flow can influence filtration and level of filtration pressure. And uh, um, also, if you remember, in the topic pathophysiology of microcirculation, uh, we discussed about Starling hypothesis and about the level of filtration, which is usually uh, uh, evaluates as a difference between hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure. And here, when we discuss about the filtration pressure uh, in nephrons, we have to also remember about one more pressure. ITP here in this evaluation is intratubular pressure. And if we will discuss about the average uh, amount of filtration pressure in NOM, uh, it's um, near 40 millimeters of mercury. And when we discuss about the characteristic of renal blood flow uh, and characteristic of glomerular filtration, uh, you remember that glomerular filter consists of the three components, the endothelial layer, uh, endothelial cells are uh, fenestrated, providing no barrier for solutes. Um, the basement membrane with different uh, structures like uh, lamina rara interna, lamina densa, and lamina rara externa. Uh, the basement membrane is a joint product of endothelial cell and podocytes. It is directly continuous with the glycocalyx and consists of the dense network of collagen type 4 and proteoglycans. Uh, and the basement membrane prevents any blood cells to pass the filter, and we already mentioned about it. And the third one is the uh, food uh, processes of podocytes, which are connected by slit diaphragms. And this uh, slit diaphragm is dense screen uh, consisting of two mere proteins, the long transmembrane protein nephrine and nephrin-1, uh, those cytosolic ends are fixed uh, by the protein podocin. And uh, finally, mm, there are two main factors which contribute to uh, perm selectivity of the glomerular filter. The first of all is physical pore size. And you understand that only small molecules cause, can uh, pass through the glomerular filter. And uh, with about 9 uh, 8 maybe nanometers in diameter, pore sites prevent larger protein from uh, passing through. And the second factor which also contribute to the perm selectivity of glomerular filter is charge selectivity. Both basement membrane and slit diaphragm are characterized by dense arise of negative charges. As most plasma proteins mm, are also negatively charged, at the physiological pH, if it's near 7.36, 7.4. And electrostatic um, uh, repulsion uh, prevents them from sleeping through pores that especially um, would be wide enough to let them pass. So when we discuss about pathology of glomerular filtration, it's some situation which can be characterized by increase or decrease filtration. And uh, if we start from uh, information about uh, the decreased filtration, it usually associates with some uh, extreme situation, which is associated and characterized by hypovolemia. It also can be characterized by constriction of different arterioles, mostly vas afferents. Uh, also, it could be caused by um, decrease of blood pressure. Uh, or um, decrease of amount of functional nephrons. Or vice versa, it could be increased some situation, increase of oncotic pressure or increase of intratubular pressure. And let maybe uh, stop here uh, about the information, uh, which types of regulation um, of blood uh, flow in glomerulus we know. Uh, usually we have two levels of regulation. Uh, Autoregulation relies on uh, feedback within an individual nephron and affects only the efferent nephron, arteriole. And systemic regulation adds to this via the autonomous neurosystem as well as via chemical mediators.
And when we discuss about auto-regulation, uh, uh, is the result of two independent mechanisms, is the myogenic response and a tubular glomerular feedback. When we discuss about the myogenic response, uh, I have to mention that an increase in arterial pressure opens stretch activated non-selective uh, cation uh, channels in smooth muscle cells of afferent arterioles, depolarizing of membrane and opening voltage-dependent calcium channel channels, leading finally to contraction. And the systemic regulation uh, associates with releasing of different hormones. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to discuss about the sympathetic uh, stimulation, which increase mostly both afferent and efferent resistance, and intense sympathetic stimulation leads to mm, drastic reduction in both renal blood flow and glomerular filtration rate. And uh, stimulation uh, by sympathetic neural system also increases uh, renin release via beta-1 uh, adrenoreceptors. Uh, next point of systemic regulation is activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which also influences level of glomerular arterioles and glomerular blood flow. And uh, uh, also natriuretic peptide, uh, which also affect the level of blood flow together with prostaglandin. Uh, so there are lots of mechanisms which finally can lead to changes of filtration and uh, it could be situation or decrease or sometimes could be increase of filtration. And it's a more rare situation um, which is caused usually by increase of catecholamine level, uh, some stress, fever, uh, increase of renal blood flow or situation with uh, hypoalbuminemia when we see decrease of oncotic pressure. Uh, so uh, let's move to the pathology of reabsorption and secretion. Uh, here mostly we have uh, to tell about the deficiency of uh, energy uh, as a cause of pathology because uh, you remember that we mentioned that some parts of um, ions and molecules reabsorbed by the active process and process of secretion is also active. So any kind of deficiency of energy can lead to pathology of reabsorption and secretion. Uh, also, um, pathophysiology of reabsorption includes uh, epithelium destruction. It also could be some endocrinopathies. You understand that primary or secondary hypoaldosteronism or some disorders of parathyroid hormone can lead to finally ions imbalance and disorders of reabsorption. And also it could be some disorders and destruction in kidney. Uh, which includes a group of disorders which we name as antubulopathies and epithelium destruction. And uh, firstly, we have to tell uh, about the pathology of sodium metabolism, uh, which is one of the most familiar and one of the most dramatic. Uh, and um, pathology of sodium metabolism, we have to differentiate into two types. Uh, it could be hyponatremia, uh, or hyponatremia. And uh, first of all, hyponatremia, uh, usually caused by uh, all of them previously mentioned uh, etiological factors, such as an enzymopathies, uh, epithelium destruction, hypoaldosteronism, etc. Uh, symptoms of hyponatremia is uh, critically more dangerous if it depends, uh, de develops acutely than uh, if it develops chronically. Uh, and um, if we have a situation with acute hyponatremia, uh, plasma osmolality falls and water starts to move inside the cells. And cells start to swell by osmotically taking up water. And um, mostly for, uh, for on different cells, um, this is no big problem, uh, but not for the brain, because brain um, can accommodate a maximum increase of 
seven, maybe eight percent in volume uh, by shifting fluid from ventricles out of the skull, but then starts to herniate through foramen magnum uh, at the base uh, of the skull. And patient may develop uh, different clinical manifestation associates with this um, edema formation um, in uh, um, CNS. And patient may suffer from um, headaches, nausea, vomiting, uh, then uh, could be confusion and eventually uh, caesarus and coma. And as in the most unfavorable outcome for such kind of patient, it could be respiratory arrest and death. Uh, in situation which it develops slowly and chronically, uh, brain cells can adapt by releasing different osmotically active substances. This uh, comprises potassium and not sodium and also different organic solutes such as myoinositol, um, choline compounds, glutamine and glutamate. Um, therefore, Chronic hyponatremia typically produces no symptoms for a long time. When we have to discuss about the consequences of uh, this uh, pathology of sodium metabolism into the level of total blood volume, uh, it usually associates with decrease of total blood volume, um, manifests with polyuria, with hypohydration and could be associated with low BP and hypovolemia. Um, antagonistic situation which with uh, uh, sodium accumulation or uh, hypernatremia. When we discuss about the etiological factors, uh, it could be all associated with a decrease of filtration, so some problems with the amount of functioning glomerulus usually or it could be associated with um, increase of reabsorption of sodium and we have to tell about the primary or secondary hypoaldosteronism. And um, when we discuss about the clinical manifestation, the same as and with hyponatremia symptoms um, are predominantly seen when the condition develops rapidly. And uh, these symptoms include lethargy, Caesarus and uh, ultimately coma. Uh, in chronic hyponatremia, elevated level of the sodium may be reached in the absence of symptoms uh, other than thirst. Uh, and uh, hyponatremia uh, is commonly seen in elderly patients in nursing home suffering from different infections especially if their mobility or mental status had already been reduced uh, to begin with. And uh, another situation, alternatively, hypernatremia may develop uh, in infants. Uh, and also disorders of um, sodium accumulation also associates uh, not only with kidney pathology, but not directly with kidney pathology, but also um, be seen in patients suffering from, from diabetes mellitus and also hope that you remember this topic when we discuss about one kind of the coma uh, as an acute complication of uh, diabetes mellitus which we have uh, to tell about hyper smaller coma which is associated with type 2 usually and it's uh, usually caused by uh, increase of the plasma osmolarity uh, with a higher level of the sodium ions, a higher level of glucose also, and uh, mostly elderly people suffer from this hypernatriemia till coma. Uh, when we discuss about the consequences um, of the sodium metabolism disorders, particularly sodium accumulation, uh, there are um, oliguria, uh, hyperhydration, and uh, hypervolemia with uh, increased level of blood pressure. And very difficult to tell about sodium metabolism without the discussion about the water metabolism. And uh, you know that there uh, could be situation with accumulation of water, uh, which is associated with decrease of amount of filtration, so decrease of glomerular filtration rate. Uh, 
or uh, accumulation of water could be associated with uh, increase of reabsorption and we see it in uh, this in the cranopathies such as in primary or secondary hypoaldosteronism and with inappropriate synthesis of ADH uh, and uh, clinically we will see the water excess as in disorders of water salt balance. And another situation uh, which includes the loss of the water usually associates with uh, decreased reabsorption uh, because of some um, enzymopathies or energy deficiency. Uh, it also could be caused by tubulopathies or some uh, um, situation with increase of filtration. And as in consequences, uh, we can see uh, polyuria and uh, hypohydration finally. Uh, also, kidney is able to concentrate uh, urine because of the creation of the hyperosmotic medullary interstitium and presence the receptors on the um, collecting duct for the ADH. And in presence of ADH, there is an increase in number of protein uh, water channels um, expressed on the luminal membrane and the water moves into the cell down its concentration gradient. And according to pathology of ADH secretion, uh, we have to discuss about two main spread situation, which is associated with decrease of ADH synthesis or releasing. And we know this is in diabetes insipidus, which manifests with decrease of reabsorption, polyuria, uh, and clinical manifestations of diabetes. Mm, and another situation with inappropriate um, secretion of ADH and which is associated with high level of reabsorption and oligoyuria. And usually uh, we have to uh, perform specific tests for diagnostic. Uh, we note this test as a Zimnitsky test, uh, when we have to uh, investigate 24-hour urine specimen. And we can um, have some conclusion from the result of this Zimnitsky test, Usually we have to investigate the level of specific gravity of urine. Uh, we can tell about the total amount of urine and the um, difference between um, the daily um, urination and night urination. And uh, finally, there are three main uh, conclusions could be done. Uh, first of all, we can put some laboratory characteristic as an isoosmotic urine when we do not have different range, uh, huge range, uh, usually it should be more than 10, uh, as an example, 1010 and 1020, and it's okay, and we do not put isoosmotic urine diagnosis, but sometimes if it less than uh, 10 during all, all these 24 hours, we can put this conclusion, isosmotic urine, so it's some loss of uh, ability, ability of kidney to concentration and dilution. And also we have to tell about the um, hyposmolarity, so low level of uh, the uh, specific gravity. And nocturia, when we see um, or the prevalence of night diuresis uh, uh, among the uh, daily diuresis or equal amount of urine at night at, and daily. Usually we should have prevalence um, in three times daily compared to the night and if we see the patient with all of these characteristics with isosmotic urine, with um, hyposmotic urine and nocturia, it gives us information about the possible uh, chronic renal failure and loss of uh, uh, ability of kidney to concentrate and to dilute. Uh, next um, pathological process which we have to tell today uh, is the pathology of secretion. And we have to tell about the uh, processes of hyperkalemia and hypokalemia. When we discuss about hyperkalemia, uh, it associates with decrease of secretion and it tubulopathies. It also could be caused by low level of filtration and both uh, acute and chronic renal failure also associate with hypokalemia. Also as a group of uh, hypokalemia uh, 
should be named um, hypokalemia associated with uh, lysine cells. So different uh, kind of lysis uh, could lead to increase of level of uh, potassium ion. And as examples could be named uh, tumor lysis syndrome in the initial phase of chemotherapy. Uh, it also could be burns, um, crush injuries, and rhabdomyolysis. Uh, also, classical example of hypokalemia is ketoacidosis, uh, but here we see mostly shift of potassium out of cells, and we see this kind of disorder in patient with diabetes mellitus type 1. It's associated with uh, lack of insulin, and acidosis together with this lack of insulin contribute to the inhibition of uh, sodium-potassium ATPase. Uh, also, some drugs uh, can have a higher uh, tendency to hypokalemia. Uh, it could be um, named digitalis, uh, cardiac uh, glycosides, uh, also beta blockers, uh, um, some uh, diuretics, and also um, RAS influencers, less times, but can lead to as an example, uh, blockers of angiotensin converting enzyme. And uh, when we discuss about the clinical manifestation of hyperkalemia, they are uh, typically and they uh, mostly are non specific. And it includes malaise, includes uh, muscular weakness, and arrhythmia. Uh, uh, hyperkalemia could be a uh, very dangerous manifestation, could have dangerous manifestation and even can lead to sudden cardiac arrest or ventricular fibrillation. Uh, ECG changes also very unspecific, so you have to be familiar with them. Usually ECG uh, changes start with the tendon tall and peaked T wave and then the P wave uh, flattens or even disappears, and the curious complex widens to the pattern reminiscent of the bundle br uh, branch block. Uh, and as in consequences also could be some uh, generalized uh, convulsions also, uh, and uh, in case of um, acute or chronic renal failure, we can use the increase of potassium uh, ions as a um, marker for the start of dialysis uh, because you have to understand that is typical in end stage of different renal disease and chronic particularly stage. And opposite situation with hypokalemia which can be associated with hyperaldosteronism uh, and with decreased reabsorption of um, potassium ions. Uh, usually um, uh, also loses um, may occur in uh, some uh, diarrhea or vomiting uh, uh, and um, because of this gastrointestinal secretion contain a considerable amount of potassium ions. Uh, and also uh, higher dose of glucocorticosteroid therapy and also some diuretics can cause hypokalemia too. When we discuss about the clinical manifestation, uh, usually we see uh, muscular hypotonus, uh, also weakness. Uh, could be arrhythmia, but compared to the previous ones when we tol uh, talk about the um, ventricular fibrillation, possibility of ventricular fibrillation, uh, here in hypokalemia uh, we see tendency to blockage and it mostly uh, um, atrioventricular blockage. Uh, and also um, uh, could be specific ECG uh, manifestations, as an example, a uh, flattened uh, T wave merges in a prominent U wave. Uh, both of this situation, uh, sodium loss or uh, sodium accumulation, uh, should be treated in time uh, because of this dangerous influence into the cardiovascular system and the higher risk of development of life threatened um, arrhythmias.
Uh, very close to the pathology of the potassium ions, we have to tell about the influence and problems with the uh, protein exchange in situation with different uh, disorders in glomerulus and in tubules, so both of them. Uh, firstly, we have to tell about the hypoalbuminemia, uh, which is a result uh, uh, in um, edema manifestation and uh, which is a result in uh, different uh, metabolic disorders uh, like um, uh, changes not only protein but fat metabolism too and it also usually associate with uh, some immune deficiency. When we discuss about the etiological factors and disorders which associate with massive proteinuria which leads to some unfavorable consequences, uh, mostly uh, this group of the glomerulopathies, it's the glomerular nephritis, different types of them. Uh, also, it could be toxic influence and uh, immune destruction of the glomerulus. Or also could be toxic or metabolic influence into the tubule, which finally leads to severe proteinuria and finally hypoalbuminemia, hypoproteinemia. And one of the most prominent syndrome which is associated with this protein exchange disorders uh, is nephrotic syndrome and we will tell about it a bit, a bit later today. Uh, one more kind of pathology is the calcium metabolism disorders and here we will see uh, disorders in vitamin metabolism, particularly it associates with low level of reabsorption of the calcium because of low level of vitamin D activity and hypocalciemia. And uh, one more thing uh, is the problems with um, regulation of acid-base balance because of influences into the processes of acidogenesis, ammoniogenesis, uh, and which is, can finally lead to renal kind of the acidosis. And when we will um, talk about the calcium metabolism and uh, about the it influence into the target organ, we have to tell that uh, usually we have some uh, vicious circle uh, when the decrease of glomerular filtration rate uh, leads to decrease of the level of calcium ions and it leads to uh, hypocalcemia. Uh, also, um, in situation with acidosis, uh, bones became acts uh, as a buffer uh, system for acidosis and it also lead to a chronic bone loss uh, in uh, different chronic renal failure. Uh, uh, so finally, we will see low level of calcium, which associates as an um, etiological factor, by, but as a way of pathogenesis, we also uh, will see a uh, decrease of the calcium in bones. Uh, and finally, uh, increase of uh, parat hormone maintains the normal serum calcium, uh, and uh, everything uh, we can see this until the glomerular filtration rate level uh, 30 um, milliliter per minute. Uh, when it um, continues, uh, finally patient became suffer from acidosis and osteoporosis uh, because of uh, this vicious circle formation. Uh, so let's see that here in, is an example of bone metabolism disorders in uh, kidney pathology. We see that it is not only some uh, uh, unique or single pathology uh, when we see disorders of um, secretion or reabsorption, but finally this disorder can uh, lead to the another organs, target organs, and uh, finally leads to uh, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, uh, which we see in patients with uh, renal failure. Uh, mostly in patients with the chronic renal failure, because we will see this gradual improvement of symptoms from different systems. 
such as in cardiovascular system, such as in um, CNS, uh, GAT, and bones too. Uh, so you have to be familiar with uh, kidney um, pathology, and uh, we have to name which diseases of kidney uh, mostly we will meet among the, our patients. Uh, so these disorders uh, we divided into four main groups. Uh, first of all is pathophysiology and pathology of glomeruli, and we know them as an glomerulopathies. And one of the most important is the glomerulonephritis. Uh, there are group of diseases with different etiological factors, with specificity or in pathogenesis, and with a few um, syndromes which associate with this kind of disorder. Then is a group of diseases of tubules and uh, acute tubular necrosis as an, one of the most prominent example. It also group of diseases of interstitium and pyelonephritis here is a nice example. It's a group of diseases of blood vessels and nephrosclerosis also could be one of the examples. And some specific disorders also which, is, which we name in the topic of renal pathology is cystic diseases and different tumors. And let's see that um, if we make some structure inside of the renal pathology, we have to you know, differentiate them into different parts. So, first of all, it could be disorders of um, filtration, reabsorption, secretion, as we told before. Then also we have to tell about some particular disease, like glomerulopathies and tubulopathies. And one more kind of approach to the investigation of the kidney pathophysiology is the uh, um, syndromal approach. Um, some pathology of... Um, kidney, we have to um, uh, connect, collect into different syndromes. And um, um, clinical syndromes and presence of these syndromes as a complex of symptoms in your patients uh, can help you to uh, perform uh, in time and correct diagnostics for such kind of patients. Uh, so which syndromes I mean? Uh, first of all, is the two um, most common among uh, glomerulonephritis, nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome. And we today will um, listen um, interesting explanation about the, its different diagnosis. Also, it could be some changes in urine without any other clinical manifestation. Uh, so it could be asymptomatic hematuria or proteinuria. As in clinical syndromes, which could be caused by different uh, diseases, uh, we have to name acute or chronic uh, renal failure. Uh, also, as in specific clinical syndrome, we have to name uh, urinary tract infections and nephrolytiasis. And also, as in separate group of this syndrome, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And now we have to start from the different diagnosis between uh, nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome. And we have to tell thanks to the uh, Roger Sehat, uh, who helped us to understand what is the difference and um, what is the principle of different diagnostics thanks to uh, laboratory tests. So let's see. Cram. Welcome to another MedCram lecture. We're going to talk about nephrotic versus nephritic syndrome. Now, these are both syndrome types that occur in the kidney. And the question is, what's the difference between them and why do they happen in the first place? And to understand that, we really need to get into the pathophysiology of how these syndromes are different. So what we have here is a picture of a cross-section of the capillaries in a kidney. And what we have here is the endothelium. This is the endothelial cell. And it completely surrounds 
the lumen of the vasculature, and you notice that there's little slits here that allow things to get through, but not the red blood cells typically. Then this blue line represents the basement membrane, which is permeable to a, a number of things. And then finally on the outside is this epithelial cell. Now, the epithelial cell has little foot processes that you see here that look like little triangles around the edge. And basically these form a very tight sieve which allows only very small things to get through. Typically not even proteins are allowed to get through here. Proteins are too large. And these what we call podocytes are helpful for that. So if you want to imagine that we've got fluid okay, leaving and when that fluid leaves the vasculature lumen and goes through the slits in the endothelium and the basement membrane and comes out even through the podocytes of the epithelial cells in the kidney, what we're left with here is basically Bowman's space. This is in Bowman's capsule, of course. And all of this fluid eventually, unless it gets reabsorbed, is going to go down into the toilet, okay? And it flushes down. So basically, anything that gets outside this area is going to eventually end up in the urine. I think that's a very important thing to remember. If you can remember the schematic of what a glomerulus looks like, you'll remember that you've got a, a vasculature that comes in and then leaves. And you've got a Bowman's capsule here that picks that up. That's what we're looking at here in this picture. And that gets picked up, goes into the proximal convoluted tubule, down the descending loop of Henle, up the ascending loop into the distal convoluted tubule, and then into the collecting ducts and then out again to the toilet. So once again, this is a epithelial cell, and this is a endothelial cell. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to divide this picture, if you will, into two. And on this side, we're going to talk about nephrotic syndrome. And on this side, we'll talk about nephritic syndrome. So nephrotic syndrome is fairly straightforward. It's a process where, for some reason, these podocytes, which are all connected to the epithelial cell, aren't working or they get lost or they recede or they involute. Something makes them disappear. And as a result of that, they're not able to keep the protein in. And so as a result of that, there is loss of protein. And it's quite substantial. In fact, uh, on the order of three and a half grams of protein per day can be lost. Now, this tremendous loss of protein has its consequences. Um, one of the first symptoms that you'll see is that the urine is very frothy. Plus, frothy urine is caused by protein in the urine. Now, don't get alarmed if your urine is frothy because there's a certain amount of protein that's in there naturally, I guess. Uh, there is some surfactant and uh, other type of chemicals that will make naturally your urine frothy. But if it's especially frothy, think about protein in the urine. Now, as a result of this, you're also losing protein. So if there's not enough protein in your intravascular space, you're not going to be able to keep that fluid in the intravascular space, and you're going to have more leakage of fluid. And so this is what we see in patients with loss of protein is they become edematous. And they'll have edema just about all over their bodies, periorbitally, even in their legs, and sometimes even in their lungs. Probably the main loss of protein is albumin. 
Albumin is the major protein that keeps fluid in the blood vessels. Now, when albumin goes down because of its loss, the liver has to compensate. And when the liver compensates, we get increased lipids in the blood. This is another sign of nephrotic syndrome. There's also another protein that's lost called antithrombin-3. Now, antithrombin-3 is a very important anticoagulant. In fact, it's the same protein that heparin utilizes to exert its effect. So the point is, is that if antithrombin-3 is also going down in this situation, the patient is going to have a hypercoagulable state. And since this protein is lost here in nephrotic syndrome because these podocytes are not working very well, the renal vein, this is the blood going back after it's lost, is going to be especially poor in antithrombin-3. And that's where we tend to see thrombosis. And if there's a thrombosis in the renal vein, this could embolize and you could get blood clots to the lung. So you should think of DVTs and pulmonary embolisms or PEs in patients with nephrotic syndrome. So to review nephrotic syndrome, it's basically a problem with the podocytes or even the basement membrane, anything that allows protein to sieve through here, causing frothy urine, decreased albumin, increased lipids both in the serum and also in the urine, okay? you'll see antithrombin-3 being reduced, that leading to a hypercoagulable state. Typically, there's about three and a half grams of protein lost per day. Now, there are diseases that are not of the kidney, which can cause nephrotic syndrome. These are called secondary causes of nephrotic syndrome. And there are diseases which specifically affect the kidney, which can cause nephrotic syndrome. These are called primary nephrotic diseases. We'll talk about those in another lecture. Now, on the nephritic side, completely different mechanism of action for causing nephritic syndrome. Whereas before there was a problem with the loss of podocytes, in nephritic syndrome, what we have is immune complexes. So an antibody meeting up with another antigen and complexing This type of an immune complex will lodge itself in the capillary, as seen here, and it will elicit an immune response against these capillaries and against these antigens. Now, as a result of this, a number of white cells are recruited, as drawn here. There will be many more white cells. As a result of this inflammatory response to these immune cells, these areas will become inflamed, break down, and it will allow red blood cells to pour through these openings. Not only that, but also white blood cells to come through. And of course, since these openings are big enough for whole cells to get through, there's also very easily allowed for protein to come through as well. And so very often, even though the patient may have nephritic syndrome, they may also have what we call nephrotic range proteinuria. So the protein may also be high in nephritic syndrome and leading to all the things that we saw over here in nephrotic syndrome. But in addition to that, there's something that's very, very different. Remember, we said all of this stuff on the outside eventually goes into the urine. And so what do you think we would expect to see in the urine? In addition to protein, as just mentioned, we would also expect to see blood in the urine, sediment in the urine because of this breakdown products, and also what we call pyuria or white cells in the urine as well. And so as a result of this, there are a few symptoms that we see in this nephritic syndrome. The first thing we see is hematuria. That's blood in the urine. The next thing that we'll see is oliguria, or low urine output. And that's because the glomerulus is being damaged, and so it can't filter as much because this immune deposition here is not going to allow the free 
filtration of filtrate, it's going to become inflamed and the glomerulus is going to start to shut down. That causes a low GFR. The other thing that you'll see is high blood pressure because of that lack of filtration, so hypertension. The last thing you'll see is granular casts. So this is the main difference between nephritic and nephrotic. Usually there's more inflammation on the nephritic side. There's less on the nephrotic side. Typically, if you just see an increase in protein in the urine at very high levels, like three and a half grams a day, and nothing else, there's no active sediment is what they would say, then think of nephrotic syndrome. If on the other hand, you see a lot of cells, debris, sediment, and inflammatory cells, think of nephritic syndrome. Now, just in nephrotic syndrome, where there are primary and secondary diseases which can cause nephrotic syndrome, there are also primary and secondary diseases that can cause nephritic syndrome. And we'll discuss that in upcoming lectures. Uh, so, as you understand from this explanation, uh, there are two main spread uh, syndromes among the patients with glomerulopathies, uh, which is associated with uh, proteinuria, uh, with metabolic disorders, sometimes with hematuria, etc. And if we are going to do some uh, differentiation of diseases, uh, which is manifested with nephrotic syndrome or nephritic syndrome, it looks um, like it represents on the slide. So nephrotic syndrome uh, mostly associated with uh, minimal change to disease or some focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. It also um, could be seen in patients with diabetic uh, glomerular sclerosis, amyloidosis, some uh, drugs influences or allergy. And nephritic syndrome is the classical patognomal syndrome for post-infectious glomerular nephritis. And you know that um, it's the most common kind of glomerular nephritis. 60 to 70 percent among all types of glomerular nephritis associated with uh, post infectious process and it manifests with nephritic syndrome with this classical tetrate or pentate with hematuria, uh, with increase of blood pressure, and with um, slight um, proteinuria. And another cause of uh, nephritic syndrome it could be IgA or immune nephropathy, uh, so also seen uh, nephritic syndrome as most common. Uh, if we are going to discuss about other syndromes, uh, as an example, um, hematuric syndrome or proteinuria, uh, as an example, asymptomatic syndromes, it also uh, associates with uh, usually disorders uh, like uh, glomerular abnormalities and uh, usually we see uh, such kind of disorders uh, in a mild uh, a mild damage of glomeruli uh, compared to the rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis uh, where we see full loss of renal function if in a few days or weeks and uh, it uh, uh, could be manifested by microscopic hematuria uh, with dysmorphic RBCs, uh, with casts from RBC, and uh, also mild to moderate proteinuria. So you see that almost the uh, nephritic syndrome, but associated with specific clinical picture, like rapidly progressive and uh, higher risk of development of acute renal failure. Uh, so, um, you understand that uh, we are now very close to explanation and to investigation of pathogenesis of uh, glomerular disorders or glomerulopathies. And uh, uh, also today we discussed about the uh, filtration membrane, which is consists of this three most layer. And you have to understand that this filtration membrane is the target for... Uh, glomerular uh, nephritis. So in glomerular nephritis we will see inflammation uh, which is associated with immune mechanisms with activation of both cellular and humoral mechanisms. Uh, 
which finally leads to damage of uh, glomerular uh, filtration membrane and which is finally manifests with this nephrotic or nephritic syndrome. So we have to name some uh, general things which is associated with glomerular nephritis as a group of disease. Uh, first of all, you have to understand that um, glomerular nephritis are immunologically mediated diseases uh, of glomeruli. And if it's immunologically mediated injury, it's clear that uh, usually kidneys involved symmetrically and could be situation of uh, it's the some um, well, local injury of uh, glomeruli and, and kidney. But sometimes this renal lesion uh, could be as a um, part of generalized disease. And a good example of such, uh, such disorders is systemic lupus erythematosus. So according to this uh, primary or secondary etiology, we can subdivide it, uh, glomerular nephritis into primary uh, when pathology is confined to the kidney. Uh, or secondary, when kidney abnormality is only um, part of multi-system disorders. And uh, let's see how it looks classification of glomerular nephritis. A primary, uh, it's mostly minimal change disease, focal uh, and segmental glomerular sclerosis, uh, membranose, uh, membranose nephropathy, acute post-infectious glomerular nephritis, uh, uh, IgA nephropathy and membrano-proliferative glomerular nephritis. And chronic glomerular nephritis also we um, have to name in primary glomerular disease. As in secondary to systemic, SLA, uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, lymphoplasmatic disorder, good pasture and veganer, uh, good pasture syndrome and veganer's granulomatose. Uh, and uh, glomerular nephritis secondary to um, different extra renal infections. And as a separate group, we have to name uh, there are three most common hereditary disorders which involve uh, glomeruli. It is an Alport syndrome, Fabry disease, and podocytes lead diaphragm protein mutation. And uh, now we have to start from the pathogenesis and investigation the main ways of pathogenesis of glomerular nephritis. Uh, generally, we have to recognize there are two main mechanisms of um, pathogenesis. It could be um, immune complex injury, as in most human glomerular nephritis, or fewer than 5% among all glomerular nephritis could be deposition of anti-glomerular basement membrane antibody. Uh, but it doesn't matter which kind we have in our patient, both of these mechanisms activate secondary injury or secondary alteration uh, which produced glomerular damage. And when we will discuss about the common this immune complexes injury, we also have to subdivide it into two types. It could be injury resulting from deposition of soluble circulating antigen antibody complex in glomeruli, or in another situation with formation of uh, uh, antibodies in situ within the glomerulus, uh, either with insoluble or fixed uh, antigen, or with molecules planted with the glomerulus. And antigen could be in such situation exogenous, usually um, hemolytic streptococcus, or endogenous, as an example, it could be um, uh, antibodies to host DNA in case of patient with systemic lupus erythematosus. If we are going to the uh, schematical um, explanation of uh, this kind of uh, immune uh, complexes deposition, we see that it could be different situation or circulating immune complexes, or the in situ formation. But most important that this um, activation and formation of these immune complexes leads to um, network of another molecular interaction and activation of secondary um, alteration. And if we are going to name 
components of this uh, inflammatory reaction, we have to, uh, to uh, answer that uh, we will see activation of complement system by classical pathway. Uh, we will see also activation of coagulation cascade and fibrin deposition. Uh, we will see platelet segregation and also activation of kinin system. So everything uh, um, develops according to type 3 of allergic reaction. And uh, also, as, as an addition to mentioned before mechanisms, uh, glomerular lesions uh, consist of leukocytic uh, infiltration into glomeruli and variable proliferation of different kind of cells like endothelial cells, mesangial cells, parietal epithelial cells, so residental cells which finally result in an increased uh, capillary permeability and glomerular damage. And uh, I'm sure that this severe inflammatory reaction uh, leads to loss of um, glomerular uh, barrier function and manifested, manifested by proteinuria and uh, usually we see reduction in glomerular filtration rate. Uh, you understand that uh, most um, prominent pathogenetical mechanism of reduction of <clears throat> glomerular filtration rate is the decreased amount of functioning glomeruli. And one of the important uh, injury and important link in this inflammatory cascade uh, is the link between complement system, activation of leukocytes, its um, migration, and releasing of different biologically active substances. As an example, releasing of proteases, which finally leads to degradation of glomerular basement membrane. You know about the direct link between free radicals oxidation and um, respiratory burst with proteases activity. And finally, we will see cell damage and reduction in glomerular filtration rate. And as in other cells which is participate in this inflammation, we have to name monocytes and macrophages. Uh, platelets also participate in these disorders in blood flowing glomeruli and also participate in releasing of different mediators such as prostaglandins and gross cells, gross factors. And also we will see a uh, releasing of fibrin related products which can cause glomerular cell proliferation. So depends on a situation, depends on uh, development and um, pathogenetical mechanisms in some kind of patients, we will see uh, proliferation and um, as in consequences we will see formation of glomerular sclerosis. Uh, if uh, we will discuss about the clinical manifestation of patients with um, glomerular nephritis, uh, it's classical acute nephritic syndrome with macro or microscopic hematuria, mild proteinuria, oligouria, hypertension, um, not severe edema, and sometimes it could be uremia if we see loss of uh, 70 or 80 percent of amount of functioning glomeruli. Or sometimes if it's ma some mild or uh, focus um, injury, we will see development of nephrotic syndrome. And uh, if we are going to discuss about particular types of glomerular nephritis, we have to start from the one of the mild type, and we know this as a focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Uh, this lesion is characterized by <clears throat> sclerosis, which affects some but not all glomeruli. So we see the focal involvement uh, of glomeruli in this um, pro process of sclerosis. And usually it associates with uh, HIV infections or heroin abuse. Uh, it could be secondary to other forms of glomerular nephritis. Uh, as an as example, it also could be as a maladaptation after nephron loss or some um, congenital forms resulting from the mutation affecting cytoskeletal or related, uh, related proteins. 
And as you understand that clinically this kind of mm, glomerulopathy is characterized by development of nephrotic syndrome with massive proteinuria uh, and with uh, severe <coughs> generalized edema. Another kind of glomerulonephritis is membranose type. Usually it is idiopathic, but could be secondary to other disorders, usually associates with infectious. Uh, we have to tell that this kind of glomerulonephritis uh, characterized by development of autoimmune reaction against unknown renal antigen, uh, immune complexes formation, and activation of these residental cells such as mesangial cell and podocytes. And it leads to liberation of proteases and free radicals, which can lead to damage of capillary wall. Uh, this kind of glomerulonephritis is characterized by formation of subepithelial deposits and thickness of uh, glomerul glomerular basement membrane. And if we are going to investigation of morphology of such kind of glomerulonephritis, we will see this formation of <clears throat> deposits, subepithelial deposits formation. Uh, next kind of uh, glomerulonephritis, one of the most frequently occurring, and we already discussed about that, it's post-streptococcal or acute post-infectious glomerulonephritis. It's associated with pneumococcal, also not only streptococcal, and also could be caused by <clears throat> uh, previous development of measles, chickenpox, hepatitis B and C. Uh, this kind of glomerulonephritis is characterized by immune complex formation, and uh, usually we will see granular deposits of IgG uh, and activation of complement system, and as a pathognomic a kind of um, symptoms in post-infectious glomerulonephritis, we uh, have to name uh, development and formation of subepithelial humps. Another kind of glomerulonephritis, and you remember that it is common for um, hematuria and nephritic syndrome, such as in previous ones, it's uh, IgA nephropathy. Uh, usually children suffer from this kind of nephropathy. Uh, usually they uh, suffer from hematuria uh, after upper respiratory tract infections and it's characterized by deposition of IgA in the mesangium. Uh, variable prognosis for the, such kind of nephropathy. Um, some percent is characterized by slow progression to chronic renal failure in period of 20 years. So it could be promoted to the chronic and it's one of the most important question uh, when we discuss about glomerulonephritis, uh, its chronology. Uh, so some of glomerulonephritis is characterized by full recovery, restoration of renal function and no um, consequences, no unfavorable outcomes. Uh, some of them is characterized by um, subacute form, but unfortunately um, half um, of some of glomerulonephritis leads to formation of chronic forms, which um, durate um, many months and years, and finally can result in uh, chronic renal failure. And if we are going to discuss about the clinical manifestation, the most important idea is to perform screening from time to time for the patient with a case history of acute glomerulonephritis. And we have to, to find or we have to check level of protein in urine, level of blood pressure among this patient and biochemical tests. Because uh, usually if we do not sum this screening or periodical check, check up of the patients, uh, it could be found as an um, just during routine medical examination symptoms of chronic glomerulonephritis like proteinuria, like hypertension or even azotemia. Uh, 
Uh, and clinically, it manifests such as an acute, it could be nephritic or nephrotic syndrome, and microscopic hematuria is usually present. So, uh, you should be uh, very careful with this kind of patients uh, because uh, you have to understand that some percent among this patient unfortunately will suffer from chronic renal failure finally and uh, they uh, need and require chronic hemodialysis and that is an approach for the treatment or even renal transplantation. And from glomerulopathies we have to move to the diseases affecting tubules and interstitial and if we may we will make some um, classification or will divide such kind of disorder we have to name that um, one of the most dangerous kind of uh, among tubal interstitial disease is acute tubular necrosis and also we have some itis so inflammatory disorders acute and chronic pyelonephritis and also drug-induced interstitial nephritis. And uh, let's start from acute tubular necrosis because it is the most common cause of acute renal failure. Uh, usually we have to name that in acute tubular necrosis we see destruction of tubular uh, epithelium. And uh, it's usually a reversible lesion, but unfortunately uh, severe injury into tubular epithelium lead finally to acute loss of renal function with oligouria when you, uh, amount of urine less than uh, 40, uh, 400 milliliters per day till anuria when a level of urination less than 100 milliliters per day. And when we discuss about the tubular necrosis etiology, we have to subdivide this kind of disorders into ischemic type and nephrotoxic type. Ischemic type is associated with severe hypoperfusion. It can be caused by hypovolemia and trauma, or it could be some redistribution of the fluid in case of septicemia or acute pancreatitis, or it could be some loss of vascular tone. Another cause associates with heavy metals uh, influence like mercury, like calcium chloride, antibiotics like hentamicin. And if we are going to discuss about the pathogenesis of acute tubular necrosis, we also have to mention that tubular injury associates with a uh, higher level of sensitivity of tubular epithelium to different toxins and it finally leads to uh, injury of the tubules um, some uh, um, um, formation of tubular debris which can block urine outflow and increase the pressure and sometimes we will see fluid leak in interstitium and it leads to collapse of the tubules and from another point of view we see not only tubular injury but blood flow disturbance uh, it could be endothelial injury or some other etiological factors which finally leads to uh, severe damage and um, tubular necrosis. And if we are going to perform some uh, scheme of pathogenesis of um, acute tubular necrosis, let's see how it um, associates. It doesn't matter which etiological factor we have, ischemia or nephrotoxins, it has um, two main way of uh, damage, so it's damage of blood flow and tubular damage, which finally leads to a severe decrease of glomerular filtration rate <clears throat> because of decrease of uh, um, uh, blood flow in glomeruli. It also associates with decrease of tubular fluid flow. And sometimes, if we see this formation of casts, increase of intratubular pressure. And finally, it results in oligouria. Also, as a questionable mechanism of development, we can tell about direct glomerular effect, but mostly we tell about the tubular damage. And finally, it results in um, acute renal failure, with all stages and manifestation of its development.
we will discuss a bit later about the acute renal failure and come back to this topic uh, in questions of symptoms and prognosis and approaches for the treatment. And another kind of the tubular interstitial nephritis uh, is this um, routine and um, simple disorders such as an acute pyla or chronic pyelonephritis, which we um, could subdivide it into infectious or non-infectious into the cause and which is associated with different spread of infectious. It could be hematogenous spread or ascending infectious, as an example, colonization in urethra, uh, and uh, here we see high prevalence of the uh, pyelonephritis among female compared to the male. If we are going to discuss about the symptoms, mostly is the non-specific inflammatory symptoms like fever, like malaise, it could be some pain. Uh, in urine, we see the increase the level of WBC uh, and bacteriuria. If we see lots of WBC in urine, uh, we name this symptom as in pyuria. And also could be some dysuric uh, symptoms, uh, some frequency, some um, uh, irritation during urination, etc. Uh, for um, diagnosis of acute pyelonephritis, we use uh, general laboratory test and routine uh, urinalysis help us to think about it and Nechiporenko's test, which gives us information about RBC and WBC uh, in urine, help us to put diagnosis of acute pyelonephritis. So, increased amount of WBC uh, presence of bacteria and uh, some uh, fever gives us information. A little bit more difficult with chronic pyelonephritis uh, because usually it's associated with not only some um, transient inflammation, it's associated with in interstitial inflammation and scarring of the renal parenchyma. And it's the problem for the chronic pyelonephritis because uh, together with uh, chronic glomerulonephritis, uh, chronic pyelonephritis could be um, as a cause of chronic uh, renal failure. Uh, and um, if we are going to uh, tell about the classification uh, of forms of chronic pyelonephritis, it could be two types. One of them is associates with recurrent infections, and we know it is a chronic obstructive pyelonephritis. Another one associates with presence of vesica ureteral uh, reflux, and we know this uh, kind as a chronic reflux associated pyelonephritis. And when we discuss about the chronic pyelonephritis, the same uh, should be diagnosed in time. Uh, because long-term presence of the chronic glomerulonephritis could lead to uh, deformation of the uh, PLV caliceal system and could lead to uh, loss of um, you know, renal function. If we will discuss about the, some specificity of chronic uh, pyelonephritis from the clinic, uh, usually we will see uh, tubular dysfunction in clinic like polyuria, nocturia. Sometimes it could be hypertension and uh, investigation gives us information about contracted kidneys. Um, if we will compare um, glomerulonephritis and pyelonephritis as, an causative, as causative agent of chronic renal failure, glomerulonephritis is much more um, I think that 15 to 70 percent uh, glomerulonephritis and 15 percent for pyelonephritis. But uh, nevertheless, you have to remember about these patients and have to make um, a routine screening and check up for the patients with possible chronic uh, pyelonephritis. And one more kind of tubular interstitial disease is drug induced interstitial nephritis. When we discuss about this kind of um, inflammation, it associates with hypersensitivity reaction. But compared to the glomerulonephritis, we have an, another 
uh, target here. Uh, so it's interstitial uh, tissue uh, of kidney and it associates with um, uh, exposure of different kinds of uh, medications. As in most prominent groups which can cause drug-induced interstitial nephritis as antibiotics, uh, diuretics and uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. As an additional um, symptoms which gives us information about the possible drug-induced interstitial nephritis, we have to tell about fever, eosinophilia and rash. Uh, and uh, also we will see increases in example of IgE, which also gives us information about the possibilities of development of such kind of injury. Uh, uh, in spite of uh, this um, not so severe damage, sometimes it can result in acute renal failure. So be careful and uh, you have to uh, investigate the case history of the patients, um, some anamnesis vita, anamnesis morbi, and if you have some information about exposure begins 15 days after intake of medication and clinically manifestation of nephritis, which manifests with hematuria, proteinuria, some fever uh, or eosinophilia, you have to think about the possible development of uh, drug-induced interstitial nephritis. And uh, also I have to uh, talk to you about the one more kind of injury uh, in kidney, uh, which is diseases involving blood vessels. Uh, because you understand that uh, atherosclerosis uh, uh, can, can lead to development of nephrosclerosis finally. And uh, as in spread disorders which can characterized by involving of blood vessels, it could be benign nephrosclerosis, um, it's specific changes in benign hypertension uh, when uh, kidneys became symmetrically atropic. Uh, also, we have to tell about malignant uh, nephrosclerosis, uh, which is associated with um, higher level of um, BP and uh, tendency to intravascular thrombosis. Uh, and uh, one more and one of the most dangerous is uh, the diabetic nephropathy, which is also associated with damage of blood vessels. And it's usually associated with double influence. From one point of view, it's associated with microangiopathies, but presence of macroangiopathies also negatively influences kidney function among the patients with diabetes mellitus. So if we discuss about the diabetic nephropathy, unfortunately, is the third one cause of the chronic diseases, which can lead to development of uh, chronic renal failure. So also have to be very careful with diabetes patient and uh, their primary disease, diabetes mellitus, should be treated in time and we haven't, have to have the um, more or less permanent uh, level of blood glucose level to avoid development of diabetic nephropathy. And let's see very brief but very uh, beautiful uh, video about the development of diabetic nephropathy. The development of diabetic nephropathy involves hypertension and hyperglycemia-induced changes in multiple pathways that contribute to morphological changes in the kidneys. The glomerulus is a globular-shaped structure composed of capillaries that are actively involved in the filtration of fluid from the blood to form urine. With diabetic nephropathy, early glomerular hemodynamic changes include hyperfiltration and hyperperfusion, which result in microalbuminuria. Increased afferent arteriole dilation due to a dysfunction in the vasoconstrictive autoregulatory response contributes to increased intraglomerular pressure, which is associated with greater mesangial cell matrix production. Expansion of the mesangial area, an early morphological change with diabetic nephropathy, is caused by greater extracellular matrix deposition and mesangial cell hypertrophy, 
This expansion is associated with a decreased glomerular filtration rate and a reduction in the surface area for filtration, which marks the beginning of renal failure. As this process continues, the glomerular basement membrane thickens, and this may eventually lead to glomerulosclerosis. All of these changes in glomerular hemodynamics cause stress and strain on the kidneys, which, if left untreated, may result in renal failure. So, guys, as you understand, uh, that we move from the acute and chronic different pathology of kidney into um, definition and explanation of renal failure. As you understand, the renal failure is the uh, the most negative and most unfavorable outcomes for the patient with kidney disorders and it uh, unfortunately can result in uh, or um, long-term um, very low quality of life for the patient with uh, chronic hemodialysis or uh, these patients can need the liver transplantation and as in one of the uh, possible method for the treatment for such kind of patient. If we discuss about renal failure, it's clear that we divided it into acute and chronic. And uh, if in acute situation we can hope that we will see um, some resolution of the inflammatory process and restoration of the function of uh, uh, glomeruli, unfortunately in chronic renal failure, uh, we have only progression and promotion of disorder and unfortunately this patient needs the uh, hemodialysis. And if we, we will discuss about the amount of the uh, function in glomeruli uh, which manifests for renal failure, 60% uh, of damaged glomeruli and 30% of functioning glomeruli gives us already clinical manifestation of azotemia as in one of the prominent signs of renal failure and uremia as in one of the most dangerous. So let's talk about renal failure. When we discuss about the um, pathognomic sign of renal failure, it determined by measurement of glomerular filtration rate and it decreases below 40 milliliters per minute. And patient became suffer from uh, increase of level of uh, nitrogenous substances like urea, like creatinine and uric acid. Um, started from uh, acute renal failure, I have to tell that we have to subdivide it into three types. It's pre-renal, which is associated with disorders of blood flow, with an renal intrinsic, and post-renal, which is associated with obstruction and redistribution you will see in SCOM. If we discuss about etiological factors of pre-renal renal failure, it could be caused by hypotension, uh, cardiogenic different situations like myocardial infarction. It could be some vascular damage uh, like uh, vasculitis or thromboemboli. It could be a redistribution of fluid in boil obstruction or some cirrhosis. It could be volume depletion uh, caused by different losses or drug-induced injury. If we discuss about the uh, acute uremia due to renal parenchymal disease, it caused by acute renal tubular necrosis, and we uh, today already discussed about it. So, um, tubular necrosis together with um, uh, damage of the tubal epithelium and additional influence uh, of the um, blood flow uh, in glomerulus finally leads to development of acute renal failure. And if we will discuss about some causes, as additional to mentioned before, for tubular necrosis uh, could be caused uh, myoglobinemia, hepatorenal syndrome, if you remember previous lecture, we've discussed about it. Uh, sometimes uh, pancreatitis or burns also can lead to acute tubular necrosis. And um, one of the most successfully treated kind of acute renal failure or post-renal uremia, which is characterized by obstruction of urinary tract from different calices. Mm, uh, it's uh, usually characterized by in-time re uh, removal of this uh, cause of obstruction and uh, restoration of 
renal function. According to the pathogenesis, we divided stages uh, of acute renal failure into the three types. Uh, first stage is oligouria, second stage is polyuria, and the third one is recovery phase. And when we discuss about the first stage, oligouric stage, in acute situation it's characterized by the most prominent damage of glomeruli. So we see decrease of amount of functioning glomeruli and it leads to uh, accumulation of uh, different waste products and it manifests with azotemia, with hypokalemia, with acidosis and hyposmotic hypogydration. Uh, you see that we name different uh, definition we tell about azotemia and uremia and what is the difference between these two uh, processes. When we discuss about uremia it's most um, dangerous situation than azotemia because in uremia we will see complex of metabolic disorders such of them associates with uh, nitrogenous waste with azotemia but as an additional, we will see changes of sodium and potassium ions. We will see increased level of different bioactive substances, which normally clear it renally. Uh, also, we will see uh, some decreased amount of another hormone, which produced uh, by kidney. And it also associates with decreased of body temperature and diminished lipoprotein lipase activity. As in clinical manifestation, uh, which um, we see in acute renal failure uh, as an additional to this increased um, nitrogenous wastes. Uh, patients suffer from anorexia, uh, patients suffer from pericarditis, uh, could be additional neuropathy, pruritis, and we see uh, involvement of other system in process, so patient can suffer from renal failure, or uh, suffer from uh, respiratory failure or GIT injury which manifests with nausea and vomiting. If uh, we see restoration of um, glomerular filtration rate increase and restoration of glomerular basement membrane or uh, restoration of tubal epithelium, we will see movement and promotion of oligouric stage into polyuric stage. So, so the second one polyuric and we, if we see the polyuria in patients with acute renal failure, it is a favorable sign. It's the good, uh, good for the patient. But patients still suffer from azotemia. We will see changes uh, from hypokalemia into the hypokalemia. Uh, and still acidosis. Uh, if we will discuss about the um, approaches for the treatment of patient with acute renal failure, mostly it associates with etiology. So if it pre-renal um, type of acute renal failure, we have to use firstly hemodynamic and respiratory support and uh, fluid management. If it's um, a renal renal failure, acute renal failure associates with tubular necrosis. We have to use etiological treatment, as an example, eliminate the toxic insult. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, we have to use dialysis in time to give the glomeruli time to restore, uh, to give to the tubules time to restore. And it gives us support of some another system like cardiovascular, respiratory and CNS. And uh, finally, we will see recovery of this patient. So not so uh, dangerous. It it dangerous, but uh, as in prognosis, according to current um, possibilities to treat of the patient, to use different extracorporal method of treatment, not so bad prognosis for such kind of patients. And you, as in uh, medical doctors, have to remember about the prevention of the acute renal failure. So you have to think when you administer some medicine to the patient. You have to remember about the possible nephrotoxicity. You have also uh, to diminish risk of the nosocomial infections, etc., etc. So you know, be careful with this kind of patient.
And if we discuss about the chronic renal failure, uh, a bit more dangerous situation, unfortunately, uh, because we, we have to tell about the chronic progressive situation and loss of kidney function. And uh, unfortunately, it spends several years to the end stage of renal failure. And in this end stage of renal failure, patient needs or dialysis or kidney transplantation. Uh, because we will see prog progression of the uremia of the patient. If we discuss about the uh, etiological factors which leads to chronic renal failure, mostly is the patients with diabetes, uh, glomerulonephritis, um, some chronic pyelonephritis, and um, this chronic renal failure represents with the progressive and irreversible destruction of kidney structures. And um, here let's see redistribution of the glomerular of the etiological factors um, for the chronic renal failure depends on etiology. Uh, if we are going to discuss about some stages of chronic renal failure, we have two kinds of classification. One of them classified chronic renal failure in two different stages according to glomerular filtration rate. And we have to tell about uh, mild renal impairment, moderate, severe, and end stage. And also, according to the classic and uh, according to pathogenesis, we divided also chronic renal failure into polyuric stage, oligouric stage, and uremic. So very close to acute, but vice versa. If here we started from polyuric and then oligouric and then anuric and uremic, in um, acute was uh, another redistribution of the stages. So firstly, patients with chronic renal failure started from polyuria. Uh, polyuria with all these syndromes which we discussed before with uh, loss, uh, manifestations of um, decrease of ability kidney for concentration and dilution. And patients suffer from isosmotic urine, hyposmotic and nocturia. Uh, also, we see increase of different waste products like increase of creatinine level and uri uric acid level. And uh, uh, also, we see influence of urea into the another organ. So, patient became suffer from different urticaria. It could be gastrointestinal tract injury. It could be elimination of urea by lungs, uh, etc. Then, after polyuric stage, we will see uh, development of oligouric stage and azotemia in this stage progresses, uh, hypokalemia increases. Uh, we will see uh, this disorder associates with vitamin D and calcium and acidosis. Also, patient became suffer from anemia because of low level of synthesis of erythropoietin and hypertension. As in final and the most negative manifestation could be development of uremic coma. And let's see, uh, when we discuss about the symptoms, uh, we will see multi-organic insufficiency. So GIT tract uh, involved, uh, endocrine system involved, uh, renal osteodystrophy we see, a CNS and cardiovascular system, and bone marrow function too. So we will see complex of... Uh, factors which leads to, um, to multi-organic insufficiency. And when we discuss about the um, like prognosis for the patient, uh, we have some factors causing progression. Usually, uh, presence in patient dyslipidemia, proteinuria, uh, some imbalance between renal energy demand and supply, uh, presence of systemic hypertension, and as an example, intraglomerular even hypertension can lead to uh, fast progression of the chronic renal failure. And it uh, can lead to uh, development of um, uremic coma for the patient. And if we will discuss about the pathogenesis of the, some involvement of other system, uh, as an example, uh, endocrine system uh, 
uh, is characterized by disturbances and um, uh, like disbalance in hormone production. Uh, also, patient uh, can suffer from decrease of amount of some hormones and increase amount of another hormones. And when uh, we will discuss about this, uh, about it um, in details, let's see that uh, usually patients suffer from um, gonadal dysfunction. Uh, usually, this patient became insulin resistant. Uh, this patient suffer from hypothyroidism and decreased level of growth hormone and disturbances in uh, parad hormone and vitamin D metabolism. And together with this, we see additional metabolic disorders and changes uh, like hyperlipidemia, like atherosclerosis development and um, anemia and thrombocytopenia. And uh, you understand that uh, renal failure influences cardiovascular system too, so patient became suffer from hypertension and increase of afterload into the heart. So finally, we will see uh, cardiovascular insufficiency and also uh, we will see uh, impairment of the neuromuscular function and manifestations with uh, neuropathies by uremic toxins. Uh, impairment of um, uh, respiratory function, uh, sometimes it could be development of pericarditis, etc. So patient need, patients uh, need um, conservative therapy of the primary cause of chronic um, renal failure disease. Uh, then if we see progression and uremia development, this patient need a different kind of dialysis. Or it could be hema or peritoneal dialysis and uh, kidney transplantation as a best uh, treatment option. Uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes even uh, kidney transplantation after some period is characterized by injury of transplanted kidney. Depends on etiological factor, but it can give patient some years, 10, maybe 15 years, to um, good quality of life and to avoid uh, this regular dialysis. Uh, so I think that it's um, the last point for today's lectures. I hope you became more familiar with um, kidney disorders. And thank you very much for your attention. And see you soon. Goodbye.